right. Hey, everybody. This is Dax Jackson from the Psychedelic Safety Alliance, and I am here today with Kristen Karras and Sloan Ferenczak from Dance Safe, and we are going to be talking about consent and substances. I'm so glad to have you both here today. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us, Dax. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Well, uh, without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. First, um, Sloan, I wonder if you would be willing to give us a little bit of just a, a sort of a basic framing of consent. What is consent? What are the basics? And what are some of the components that, of consent that we want to be thinking about in this conversation and in our lives generally? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a majority of us have had some form of sex education at some point in our, you know, education. And, you know, so often it's involving a focus on sexual consent. Um, and there's kind of this idea that um, just in general, that it could be a one-stop shop. You ask someone, you engage in the behavior and it's over. It's consent is almost always considered in a like sexual realm. Mm -hmm. And the way I think it can be really helpful for us to think about consent is that it's a practice that applies to just how you navigate the world in general. It's mm. really a way for you um, in any interaction with another person to really be considering the well-being and the boundaries of another person in order to you know, maximize the safety of the interaction and make sure everyone's needs, um, boundaries, wants are, you know, respected and, you know, really their well-being is put first. Um, and I can think of like a really good acronym for this is FRIES. A lot of people may have heard that, um, but it breaks down what the components of consent are. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the key ones that is, is that it's free, um, which means it's freely given, that there's no coercion involved, that it's an autonomous decision um, to engage in some sort of behavior with another person. Um, the R part of that is that it's reversible, which means that it's not kind of this one-stop shop. You say yes, and you know it's always staying a yes. Uh, consent can be revoked, and it's a continuous process too. Uh, which means that at any point in the interaction, someone's boundaries may change, their desires, their wants, their needs in that moment might change. And so we need to be willing to recognize that consent can be taken back, consent mm -hmm. can change, a yes can turn into a maybe, can turn into a no. And so we need to check in throughout the process. Um, it's also informed. So it's not consent if the person isn't really knowing. They don't know what's going to happen in the interaction. They maybe don't know you. Um, they aren't in a state of consciousness where they're really aware of what's happening. You really need to have an understanding of what's going on for there to be consent there. It's gotta be enthusiastic too, which can be considered also like affirmative. It's like a yes. So lack of a no doesn't mean that there's consent there. Um, just as a, um, like we want an enthusiastic yes, a clear yes. And we want it to be specific too. So really explicit, clear. We know exactly what we're consenting to um, so that everybody's on the same page. And um, when we think of it as a practice, it applies to everything. So it's just a way to interact with anyone, whether it's when you're having a friendly conversation with them, sexual interaction, you know, using substances together. Um, and, and it's mandatory for interactions with people. We really, when we want to respect people, we need to be making sure that our interactions consensual. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's really helpful to think about consent as an ongoing practice and something we do to take care of ourselves and the people around us, that this is like a, a primary tool that we use, not just in sexual interactions as it's often discussed, but in, uh, in life generally. Uh, and mm -hmm. also in uh, the context of substance use, which is something we'll be chatting with uh, Kristen about in a moment, which I'm looking forward to. Um, I want to actually you... add something there real quick. Yeah. Um, just so it's explicitly stated, especially knowing that we're going to um, step into adding different layers into this conversation. But I think that uh, right now, a lot of um, societies like Consent 101 package currently, um, 
seems to like the baseline level of that seems to include the understanding of physical boundaries. But I also just like want to pause and also explicitly state that this also involves emotional boundaries um, and being aware of how much space one takes up is an example of being respectful of emotional boundaries in situations. If bringing up a charged, a potentially charged topic, that is a good time to ask, like, do you have space right now to like, like as I move through discharged emotion, things like that. So as we are talking about consent today, we're not talking about it solely in the context of sex. If we're just like talking about consent, um, that is something that is absolutely a practice across all mm-hmm. facets of life. And within that, that includes both physical and emotional uh, mm-hmm. boundaries. And spiritual, yeah. you know, it's, it's all, all facets of like our perception. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I wonder, uh, this this may be a bit general for right now, but I'm, I'm curious if either of you have uh, any thoughts or examples you'd like to share on other areas of daily life where consent is applicable that we may not be thinking about under that context or through that lens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I actually talked to a friend today about this. I had asked them, you know, um, as someone in the psychedelic community who also navigates in the world and so, you know, has to have some understanding of consent, like what would you like to know? What would you Mm -hmm. like us to explore? And one example that they provided was, um, that I don't think we often think about is an experience they had at a festival where a friend had um, taken a few doses um, and was tripping pretty heavily. And this person wasn't in the headspace to be around this person, wasn't expecting it and ended up Mm. being in a caregiving role and put some uncomfortable situations because the person, you know, was behaving erratically and in some ways inappropriately Mm. and something that they really kind of wanted us to explore a little bit was like this idea of um, considering those things. Like, are the people in your space consenting to witnessing you, to interacting with you? Did they sign up for this? Even if they're not, physically touching you, even if they're maybe not talking to you, how is your physical presence impacting them um, if you're going to be interacting, engaging with them? And I think that's one area that we don't often think about. Um, yeah. Trying to think about like, did I consent to what I took? Was I informed with what I took? Am I, you know, have I done anything, you know, very inappropriate with this person as far as that boundary we often think of is like a physical boundary without thinking about their emotional needs um you know the amount of emotional labor and psychological labor that might go into interacting with this person when you're not planning for it or you know signing up for that yeah yeah thank you Sloan it's super key to be clear when ingesting substances in the company of other people to be seeking consent and having dialogue about what everyone is stepping into in that given moment. But to bring it back to some of the more general examples, Dax, um, I think that a great example is sharing contact information. If someone Mm. asks me for someone's contact information, I'm always like, oh, let me check in with them. Uh, Like for some reason, I don't have a contract with this person and have an understanding, like concrete understanding of how they always feel about having their contact information shared. I always ask people before I share their contact information. Uh, I think another one, um, especially uh, uh, I've I've seen since we're, Sloan, you brought up the example of music festivals, asking before taking a photo of someone. Mm, Very important. Um, But sometimes Mm -hmm. it also can be taking a photo of someone's art. There's, you know, some people would prefer for others not to take photos of their art. They want it to be appreciated and enjoyed in person. Um, So I think that's another really great example of something that people don't often think of. And so that really just starts to go to show that it's you know, there's so much to who we are um, Mm -hmm. that falls within the context of having boundaries that we should try to be mindful of when navigating consent. And it's kind of funny. I've heard like a really great example pre-pandemic. So it's even more applicable now, but just thinking about when you meet someone and they reach their hand out, what's the most automatic thing for you to do is to take their hand. Mm -hmm. How often do you want to be actually touching that person's hand? Are you informed? Do you know what they just touched? Did they just leave that port john and now they are, you know, sharing their germs with you and you're unaware? Is that consent? And are we like 
even that can be a sort of coercive experience. We're not mm-hmm. checking in to see first. It's almost a social obligation to do it. Um, and that was, I heard that once and that like blew my mind. I'm like, yeah, I just automatically reach out even if I don't want to. And I don't feel that I can. Yeah. I think, I feel like that's particularly relevant in, uh, in the era of COVID-19. I know there's been a lot of uh, I know there's been a lot of conversation around uh, like the giving of hugs as sort of a default greeting and how that mm-hmm. is something that one needs to get consent for as opposed to just uh, assuming as a baseline. But I feel like handshakes have been so uh, have been so kind of stock and norm core for such a long time that we haven't really stopped to reflect on that at all. And uh yeah, I think it's a really good point that you bring up. And you mentioned the you mentioned uh, the way in which uh, consent is a discussion, a conversation. Mm-hmm. And I'd love it if you could go into the ways that we think about uh, consent over time. Uh, you mentioned that we're not just talking about getting consent, but establishing consent is an ongoing process. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, language is so powerful and it's, it's really important for us to kind of be reflecting about how we're speaking about these topics. Um, and really that there can be that minor shift of getting consent to establishing consent can make a huge difference. Uh, I really think that, um, you know, establishing uh, consent is highlighting the fact that it's a mutual co-created experience. You are both coming together to find a middle ground of what you both find mutually acceptable and, and enjoyable and that you're willing and eager to do. So it's not just one party, you know, seeking out a kind of transaction. I, I think also like the word getting consent implies that there's an endpoint when this is a continuous process, um, that it's a way of navigating the world. It's not a kind of this one and done situation. You get it and you're good to go. Um, and, and it really like it can also imply using getting consent it's like that you're trying to convince someone to do something. And again, this is about finding and establishing kind of this sense of mutuality that you both your needs, your identities, your selfhood are equally important in the interaction and need to be brought together um, to figure out how you're going to do this in a way that feels both fulfilling and safe for you both. Mm hmm. Um, I wonder just because I'm because I'm really into uh, into uh, details and step by step. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could give an example of what it would look like uh, for two people to renegotiate consent uh, that had been previously given or engage in a more ongoing dialogue about consent over time. Yeah, I mean, if we're thinking in um, kind of a sexual realm, this could look like, OK, you know, I'm interested in you. I would really love to kiss you right now. What are you comfortable with with right now? Okay, you're comfortable with that, great. As we're going along kissing, perhaps you you want to move a little bit further, checking in, seeing what that person is into. Maybe they're not quite ready to go all the way um, or or they're just not in a headspace for that, but they're willing to maybe do some mild touching. Um, Checking in with that, okay, I'm okay with you touching me here all right, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. How about we try this instead? It's really like about being curious and being flexible. Also, you know, being willing to get into these details, knowing that it, even if it feels maybe a little less spontaneous, that it's more exciting. There's a buildup there. And you know that the person is going to be enjoying themselves as well because they're telling you what they want and you're respecting their needs and their safety. Um, I think even just, you know, in, in general interactions that um, with a friend, you know, are you in a headspace right now for me to dump on you? Like, can I vent to you? Okay, great. Yes, but I can only do it for 10 minutes. Okay, I'm cool with that. That's perfect. Let's do that. Um, you know, rather than just dumping or, you know, only listening to one side of the, that interaction. Yeah, I, I especially like this ongoing check-in format that like mm-hmm. as interactions escalate or as you initiate maybe a new interaction with somebody that you've had previous interactions with or you've previously established consent with that it's always helpful to pause and check in at the beginning of each interaction or escalation to mm-hmm. reestablish that consent and practice engaging in that conversation yeah. in an ongoing way. Yeah. Um, 
you also mentioned something, Sloan, uh, uh, to the tune of, uh, no, I'm actually not comfortable with that. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, Kristen, maybe if you could go into a little bit what it looks like to gracefully receive a no or a decline if someone uh, asks for consent and you do not give it. Thanks for asking that, Dax. It's um, actually one of the pieces of consent that I think is not talked about enough. Um, there's such a focus on getting to yes in a lot of these conversations with consent and the part, the for things to be consensual, um, there needs to be, and for it not to be coercive, right? Um, for it to be free, that means that the person that is receiving the response after making the request has to be equally accepting of hearing both yes and a no, because if you are not gracefully accepting a no, then were you really asking for consent in the first place? Right. Um, and so um, with that, I also just want to acknowledge and have a lot of empathy that like rejection can feel really hard. Like, you know, that, that's a little hit to, an, to the ego. And um, I know that like, for me, this is something that like I had to practice. I think most people in life need to practice it. And for me, like one of the things that um, really helped me was just having some like go-to replies like and getting used to like what does it what does it look like and so you know for example you can like oh thank you for sharing that boundary with me thank you for letting me know what would feel good to you right now like thank you for like thank them because at the end of the day a boundary is a gift that someone is giving you to let you know how you two can be in relationship with each other mm -hmm. and so there should be gratitude for both yes and a no um, because if both in, in, in both of those situations, both yes or no are respected, that means that we're inherently coming closer together. I was just going to say, like, that makes me think of this really lovely quote. I don't know where I saw it, but um, it's the idea that boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. Um, I think that really kind of encompasses that. It's, it's how we can have a mutual sense of connection and care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was just about to say something similar. It's boundaries boundaries help us maintain closeness. That's mm -hmm. that's that's what they're there for. They're not to make you feel bad. They're not mm -hmm. there to make you feel rejected or unwanted. Quite the opposite, in fact. Mm -hmm. And so treating that as a gift and treating that with gratitude and appreciation um, is is the way to go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, respect has been mentioned several times. Sloan, mm -hmm. I know there's a respect framework in here that you think mm -hmm. about. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that, please? Yeah. So, you know, um, a huge part of consent is really that this is a practice of respect, respecting a person's personhood, their um, boundaries, their wants and needs in the moment. Um, and it, I think it, you can break that down into an acronym that can be really helpful when you're navigating any interaction with a person. Um, so like the first one, the R is the word itself. It's like uh, respect, the respecting that everyone is different. Everyone has different needs, different life experiences, different traumas that come up, different emotions and different ways of interpreting what is happening. And that's okay, you know, that we don't need to try to be pushing someone into the box of what we want. It's kind of a beautiful thing. Um, it, it allows us for, you know, having new and exciting interactions. Um, so I think that's the key is like respecting that we're different and that that's good. Um, the second one is E, which is empathy. And empathy uh, is kind of the core of this. We want to really understand and feel for and recognize the personhood of the person that we're interacting with. And that really involves us, you know, listening. Um, it's an act of connection. And it's really like our aim is to understand where they're coming from and why they want what they want or, you know, are setting a certain boundary. Um, the next one is self-monitoring, which I think is really important. Um, and, and really like thinking things through first, like being aware of how your lived experience, your identities might impact what you want. It might impact, you know, what's motivating you to interact with this person. It's also gonna impact your intent. You know, what do you want out of the interaction? And having this awareness allows us not only to be aware of our yeses and our no's, our boundaries, you know, what we want, 
um, which can enhance the experience and also, you know, reduce risk. But it helps us, you know, from it helps us not cause harm unintentionally by, you know, not being aware. Um, I, I've been thinking about when we inevitably make a consent mistake, when we violate someone's consent, as it, you know, it can happen with anyone on a macro or you know micro scale. That this the, the denial is what really causes a harm. The mm -hmm. denial that we have done something wrong, our unwillingness to reflect on that and own it and hold it, because it feels bad. It feels really bad to recognize you hurt someone when that was not the intent. And I think that kind of goes in hand with this rejection idea. So being able to recognize where these feelings are coming from um, and owning them, I think can be really helpful and, and, and being prepared ahead of the time um, with that um, peace, personal space, um, really just respecting someone's um, physical space, but also their mental and emotional space. Um, e is earning trust through your actions. So not just saying, you know, that you're respectful of consent, respectful of a person, but actually showing it and following through. And then the T is treating everyone as an equal, that we're all in the same soup. We all have different experiences, but no one knows, you know, any more than the other person. We're all climbing our own mountain um, and in honoring that. That's great. Um, I, 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 there's two things in there that you mentioned, uh, both mm -hmm. excitement and, uh, and self-monitoring. And I'd love to first ask you about personal monitoring a little bit. Um, just sort of on a tactical level, like if I was going into a situation where a uh, consent conversation was involved and I wanted to run a quick internal checklist and monitor my own self, what might be a couple of sample questions that I might ask myself to assess where I'm at and what I might be into and what I'm, what boundaries I might have? Yeah. So I, I think like the first thing that you can always do is just tap into how am I feeling in this moment? You know, where am I feeling? What emotions am I feeling? Where am I feeling them in my body? And how's my physical state right now? Am I tired? Am I angry? Am I, you know, really excited and like really loose and fluid and just want to go up to everyone and chat and really having an understanding of where you're at? Um, so I was like, how, how, what am I like thinking about right now? Um, I think a really key question when you were wanting to interact with anyone is like, what's motivating me to want to interact with them? Do mm -hmm. I really genuinely want to get to know this person? Do I want just a surface level physical interaction? And am I okay with them also maybe wanting that too? Um, what do I want from this person? And how do I want to engage with them? Kind of like, what's my intent here? And what's motivating me to go up to them too? So I think there's, there's a distinction between our intent and our motives. We might have the intent to have like a really pleasurable experience and that could be motivated by so many different things. Um, and, you, and you really want to understand that, um, you know, you might want to, the intent might to be have to um, have sex with someone. Is it because you, like I said, want to connect? Is it because you have a physical need that you need to get met? Could it be like ego related? I'm feeling really insecure. This would boost my ego. Mm -hmm. It's not to say any of these things are good or bad. It, is it going to work for you in that moment? And is it going to work for the other person? And are they aware? Um, and also just really reflecting on your identities and like what biases might be coming up for you, right. especially when you're considering like there's power dynamics involved in any interaction, any interaction under the sun. You know, it, how is my identity going to impact my interaction with this person and my desire to interact with this person and my motives for doing so and how I'd like to do it? So that's, that's going to be a lot of questions to ask yourself, but, you know, any self-reflection is helpful. Well, and as, as with all of these things, part of why establishing consent and having good consent practice is sadly lacking in our society is it's nuanced. It's complex. It takes time. And that's why we need to have these frameworks so that we can cover all the essential elements, uh, you know, in the most efficient and, uh, you know, compassionate way possible. The, the other thing uh, you talked about a little bit, and this would actually be a, a question for the both of you and maybe a bridge, Kristen, into our conversation about consent and drugs, um, is about that intention, is about that motivation. Because in my work as a psychedelic safety educator, one of the things I found is that um, when you're teaching people about how to engage in safe and responsible behavior, uh, there's, there's certainly like a cultural lean 
on, uh, on talking about risk and preventing risk, but most people do not come into situations where there is something pleasurable or exciting involved because they are thinking about mitigating risk. They're thinking about it because there is some benefit that they want to get. And it's very, I find it very useful in my work to connect with people first on a, uh, on the plane of benefits and then, uh, and then expand from there and show how risk can make it hard for you to get your benefits and thus uh, maybe incentivize people a little bit better to engage in some of these practices that take a little uh, take a little time and energy. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to uh, to benefits in terms of consent and how we might think about that. Um, so in terms of benefits of consent, I think that's some of like the most obvious ones that I can think of right off the top of my head is like, if we want to have pleasurable, like we want, you were just talking about, we want benefit. We want to maximize benefit. So part of that benefit often is like feeling good. Well, it's difficult to feel good when someone is violating your consent. And ultimately I really question like, how good could it possibly feel for you in the moment to be violating someone else's consent? Like what is going on there that might be perpetuating that type of, mm. that type of behavior? Um, I think that we summed it up um, really well with Sloan's quote earlier about um, the relationship between consent and boundaries and it being an invitation to be in relationship with people. Like that's how you develop relationship. Continuously establishing consent helps establish safety and safety creates the opportunity for vulnerability. And if we're able to be vulnerable with one another that's how we're able to like connect deeper with wow. one another. Um, so I really think that consent is such an access point to the beginning of really everything. Um, I'd be curious, Sloan, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, really uh, consent, I think you kind of actually touched on this, the fact that consent not only is about not wanting to uh, get in the way of your own pleasure by having your consent violated or violating another person's consent. Con having a consensual conversation is allowing you, it's giving you a roadmap for bringing someone pleasure and you're giving a roadmap to someone else for bringing right. you pleasure in the interaction. So this roadmap really can give you some details that you might not have otherwise, um, you know, can lead to more excitement, knowing what's to come. And it also allows you to have more flexibility when things inevitably go a little bit off, you know, off the road a little bit, or, you know, something needs to change in the interaction, kind of having these guardrails, like with bumper cars, you know, allows you to go a little more willy nilly and have more fun um, and explore more. And really understanding benefits also helps you reduce risks. Um, which then, you know, acts in that feedback loop to enhance pleasure as well, because like baseline of enjoyment, we need some safety. There's absolutely pleasure involved in risk. You know, there, there's that excitement there, um, but there has to be a container for it. And this conversation will provide, you know, ideally it should, when done well, provide that container. Absolutely. It's like, yeah, Kristen? Yeah, I just want to really highlight, I really like, uh, that Sloan pointed out like the feedback loop because um, I feel like it is continuous and it made me think about um, participating in community and the impact of um, we have like in our relationships and how we're showing up with others like in community as well. Um, if we are trying to establish community and we're not establishing mutual consent with one person then and others in the community are bearing witness to this and we're acting within like that's going to create a barrier not just to individual relationships but the access to building like broader networks and like the gift that community can be too and that's just one example of like you know uh how if there was a negative experience how that feeds back mm -hmm. and on the flip side if it's a positive experience then people are like oh yeah when i was out with dax last night like he was like such a pleasure to be with and i had a great time and uh it like 
I know that for me, when I'm in the process of like, and I'm building like community, like I deeply respect uh, the opinions of the people that I hold close to me and how they conduct themselves. And so um, I think that all of those things are worth to be keeping in mind. Like, it's not just the pleasure of the moment, but like, how does this impact the pleasure of the long run for us and our community around us? Absolutely. Yeah. No, no benefits without safety. And it's 2021. Having great consent practices makes you look like a rock star, makes you look like the kind of person people want to be around, especially in community. Um, uh, Kristen, I'd love to get into a little bit the second part of our conversation about consent and drugs. Um, this is, I think, an underexplored topic, and the way the conversation around consent and drugs often happens has a bit of a, a, a twinge of like abstinence-based educational languaging, messaging around it. And I'm curious if you could speak to, to that a little bit, like what the basics are of thinking about consent and drugs, and how we might think of this in sort of a broader, uh, in a broader context than just if you're intoxicated, you can't give consent. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is super key. Um, first and foremost, uh, when engaging in substances, right, uh, we're talking about uh, having effects on our own minds and our own bodies. Um, a lot of the times substance use is something that is enjoyed with others. So that means we're in a social context. Um, a lot of times substances are shared with people, um, whether that is um, a substance that is being sold at a point of sale, whether that is a substance that is being handed to a friend. Um, it's a very social activity. And uh, I think we all have a due diligence um, for like the community of people who use drugs to make sure that we are engaging in drug use in a consensual way. Mm -hmm. So what does what does that mean and what does that look like in a social context? Well, um, if there is you know a set of folks and there is one person who is providing the drugs and there is another one who is going to consume it, first and foremost, that is a power dynamic. There is someone who has access to substances who is then sharing them with others. That's just one dynamic in which that situation has a power dynamic to it, let alone what other identities or anything else might be in play in this scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, um, another possible thing at play is the individual who is sharing the substance um, in this scenario, let's assume that like they're better educated. Um, the whole, how we maneuver the distribution of power and acknowledging um, power dynamics and power exchanges is finding ways that we can try to level the playing field. And so what does that look like when engaging in substance use? Well, first and foremost, um, we should know the substance. Mm -hmm. We should know, we, first of all, we should test it, right? We are living still under the roof of prohibition. We're not running to our, you know, local regulated store where we're picking up our MDMA or GHB or LSD or ketamine, whatever suits people's fancy. Um, and so, people should be testing it. Um, from my perspective, if we want to talk about what is the most ideal situation, um, you should, if you're going to be sharing a substance with a person, you should be willing to test it in front of them. And it's yeah. something that to be demonstrating so that they have that firsthand knowledge that you yourself had when you tested it so that you know, it's all about the informed part. That's really what I'm going to be focusing here in terms of what Sloan was talking about earlier in terms of like fries being informed. So what is the substance? Did you test it? What are the effects? What are the making sure that people know what are the positive effects, the neutral effects, the potential negative effects, um, making sure that people feel like they have um, agency again to say no. Um, there is no place for peer pressure um, in mm -hmm. consumption of uh, consensual consumption of substances. Um, and then uh, I also think it's really important to know your dose. Um, this is just incredibly important. It's something I feel like is really overlooked a lot of the time in, in substance use. Yeah. Um, like for example, um, whether if you were selling a substance, I think that someone should be educated about, um, you know, if there is a press pill, like a press pill of MDMA, is there 100 milligrams of MDMA? Is there 200 milligrams of MDMA? 
Why is it scored on the back? How many doses are in one pill? Like that's an important information to know. Um, the same goes for, you know, tabs of acid, like, and then, you know, making sure that we're making investments and in having the appropriate equipment to be able to know what our dose is. There's certain drugs who um, you need to have a milligram scale in order to be dosing it appropriately. I think that it would be really inappropriate to be dosing a drug, let's say like 2CB, um, with anything that is any less sensitive um, in such a case. And so um, I think another great example um, is like GHB. Uh, I think GHB and uh, the, specifically the consumption of GHB under the roof of prohibition. Because the problem is that GHB being unregulated leads, the unregulated supply means that we have an unknown concentration of G floating around. So from one batch to another, the, the concentration of G can be changing. Therefore, like you need to be adjusting for that concentration to even know your dose in the first place. Um, so I think those are some really great examples about like the manifestation of what it means to know one's dose and making sure that you are able to communicate that to the people that you are sharing a substance with. Um, I think another great example of that, I'm going to use the GHB example again, um, but actually I, this works for other drugs. Um, if you were going to share a substance with someone, a great way to take an, an extra step further, um, depending on the context of the situation and the means that you have at the time, like letting someone see how much of the substance is on the scale mm -hmm. when you're weighing out their dose, letting them see how much of, you know, GHB might be in a syringe like those are all key ways to be engaging in that informed consent consensual manner with someone mm -hmm. um i also think it's important uh to be talking about um intention set and setting um mm -hmm. i think that in terms of set and setting uh i want to bring up the concept from earlier of self-monitoring and like where are you personally at um i think that uh people should be considering whether they're in the position to be taking on the responsibility that is sharing substances with other people. Um, also, people should that are sharing substances with other people should also think about what their boundaries are. So, like for example, um, I think a really creative um, boundary that I've uh, seen implemented before is uh, if I'm going to share this insert depressant drug. So, if I'm going to share GHB with you, I do not consent to you um, combining alcohol with it. And okay. if you wish to continue, if you wish to be able to drink alcohol like later this evening, then I'm not going to share the substance with you because I know that this interaction of these two drugs um, can be too risky beyond my, like, you know, but the comfort of my boundaries. Um, and making sure that you're helping other people understand the concept of set and setting and like what that means for them in their own experience. Um, so I hope that, you know, know your set and setting, know your substance, test it, know the effects, positive, um, neutral, negative, and knowing your dose, I would say, mm -hmm. are some of the really key factors of um, employing uh, informed consent in the context mm -hmm. of drug use. That's mm -hmm. really great. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I might, uh, I might add as well that uh, on on just sort of the self monitoring personal responsibility front, um, because everybody's biology is different, there really is no way for another person or a resource on the internet to know what your dose is. Uh, if someone and and these the variables that can impact how much one person might need to take to have a particular intensity of experience can be so wildly different from person to person. And even within the same person over time, that strategies like starting really low and going slow, like starting with a, a you're not sure and someone offers you something you've never tried and you do want to take it, starting with a threshold dose. If you want to mm -hmm. take a higher dose of something, going up by the smallest increment that you possibly can that feels like it will produce some sort of noticeable difference. Mm -hmm. And then also being um, uh, tracking, tracking whatever other substances you are on and communicating to the people around you what the other substances are that you are on and having mm -hmm. some prior knowledge. Like if you take a given, uh, let's say you take a psychiatric medication, for instance, um, having prior knowledge before going into a situation where you might be offered 
offered other substances uh, as to what compounds could potentially interact with the medication that you're on, because that's also something that is uh, that other people you can't expect other people to know. Right. So having so being being informed for yourself and having the information uh, available that other people need to take care of you is so helpful in this process. Like we're always educating each other about how to take care of each other and the more information you can provide, um, mm -hmm. better. Yeah. So even, I, even, I apologize. Oh no, please um, continue. Uh, well, I was just thinking, um, with what you were saying here that this kind of speaks to the importance also, um, of, having this sort of really thoughtful self-analysis and conversation with another person before you're on any substance, especially because, you know, while consent's reversible, the effects of substances isn't always, you know, you can't always undo it. And that, you know, that speaks to this, you know, starting low, going slow, but also it's best to talk about this when sober and, and clear, you know, planning this out while we have all of our capacities to gather as much information as we may need to have the best experience possible because yeah you can't you can't always undo it once it starts um, right yeah right i think that's i think that's really important to note that once a substance has entered your system uh that does that that is going to have an ongoing impact on any dialogue or conversation or decisions that you make for the duration of that substance being in your body it's not like uh you can just hit the pause button and be like actually can we just stop tripping balls for a second and uh and have a, a you know like a measured discussion about what we're going to do next mm -hmm. um uh I'm I'm curious, Kristen, uh, just because I'm a psychedelic safety nerd, I have to ask, do you think there are any particular or special considerations that people might want to think about when it comes to uh, uh, psychedelics and consent? Yeah, absolutely. To other substances. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know what? Mm, I said absolutely, but do I really mean that? Because, you know, I just think that so much of this is applicable across across the board, like one of the things that my gut reaction to you when I said absolutely was thinking about um, the headspace of psychedelics and how that can create space for, um, the, how that can like create some space for people to, you know, process trauma and have trauma come up. But realistically, mm -hmm. that's something that can happen when you're sober right. and, and it can happen mm -hmm. with other drugs. And I think it's something that is particularly thought of in the psychedelic community, but mm -hmm. is broadly applicable to all people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I have an immediate one. I'd have to give it some further thought. Sloan, do you have something that comes to mind while I'm trying to give this? A moment. I mean, the, the things that are immediately coming to mind for me is just that um, even with all this intention setting and thoughtfulness and, and critical self-reflection and planning, that things can go on unexpectedly on psychedelics in a way that, you know, I mean, it can happen with any substance use, but especially with something where your consciousness is altered um, and where like uh, Dax, you hinted at, or were really just made really clear that everyone can experience the same, even the same substance, the same dose yeah. of um, the same batch very differently based on a whole host of internal and external factors, whether they're subconscious or conscious, um, they come out. Um, so I think that, you know, that's something to keep in mind that there may be need, some need for some flexibility here for some, um, you know, acceptance that this can occur. Um, and that's a lot easier when we have this sort of container, um, you know, being as informed as possible, having a plan. Um, and, and really, I, you really touched on this, Kristen, that, that we want to be trauma informed as best we can. Um, and that everything can also go really, really well. You can be around people who are wildly supportive, wildly validating very trauma informed and still have a very difficult experience. Um, and that's okay. Um, and, and being mindful of that and aware that that can occur um, can really help us let go of some of the judgment and some of the pain that can keep us stuck in that difficult state. Yeah, for sure. Oh, Kristen, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think that uh, Sloan really summed it up 
summed it up well. Um, and it really just like made me think about people exploring intentionally what it means to create a container for these experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people don't have exposure to intentionally curated containers for the consumption of substances that are not alcohol. Mm -hmm. Because alcohol is a drug and alcohol is the mainstream drug that is, has many containers, right? And many social norms around it. And due to prohibition, we haven't gotten to um, in like our westernized culture to really start exploring what that what that looks like for us for all these many different substances. Um, and that's actually something I would like to build off of um, like from this previous topic, because um, for example, uh, something that I have seen communities practice in regards to intentional consumption of psychedelics together. I'm talking like an entire party, whether that is like five people or more, like up, you know, hundreds of people. Um, you know, I've seen people have some really clear communication around like, um, this is a safe container. There is, it starts off with a discussion at the beginning of like, uh, this is what our intention is for the night. This is what some of our plans are for the night. Um, you know, this is what you can expect in like this container. So like, I that could be like in a household and people knowing like, where the water is, where the bathroom is, like mm -hmm. those like little things that can like, you know, suddenly it's really difficult to put your sweater on when you're high on acid and you're like, do I have three arms? And <laughs> um, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and then moving into starting to talk about consent and always setting the stage with that, like we're, mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, setting expectations of how we're going to show up with each other while we're consuming these substances together. Um, and then uh, talking about like the drugs and doing the informed consent talk. Um, I think another great thing that I have seen um, communities um, implement is having a, uh, like a dose board mm -hmm. where people have like their names. And if you're feeling shy, like just make sure that someone knows the alias by which you go by, but having your name, having a timestamp, having what drug you've consumed and in what quantity, because if something goes sideways, then that is accessible by other people, like who would be able to, you know, provide that information to a medical professional to, you know, provide you help. And so that is when I'm starting to get into like, for me, like it might be like, wait, isn't that far removed from what consent is? Like, no, in that community, um, they're only consenting to consuming drugs with one another if they're all putting their dose on that board because no one wants to be in that compromised position of, oh shit, we're all high and something happened to our friend and we we don't know what to tell someone to help them. Um, so there, there's lots of different ways that we can go from like, you know, and one-on-one -on -one to in people choosing to consume a substance together to like multiple people consuming a substance together and what it looks like, like no matter what, it's a social contract, whether it's a con social contract between two people or two or more people and how you curate that container together to have a consensual experience that ultimately is seeking to maximize your benefit, whatever, you know, the intended benefit was, whether it was to connect, to play, to process, and perhaps all of the above. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would, I would throw in there two additional things that I've seen uh, that have worked really well. These uh, primarily I've seen in smaller group situations, um, but in addition to a dose board, um, uh, like having a, having a circle, at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of an event, and just checking in about like what's what's here with me today, mm -hmm. and what are what generally are my boundaries. Like, yeah. hey, my name is Dax. I use he/they pronouns. Uh, I'm coming in here today feeling fairly tired because mm -hmm. I am processing a challenging breakup, which I also have been processing all day, and I don't want to talk about tonight. You know, mm -hmm. so like. But if you want to talk with me about this topic or this topic or this topic, these are totally on the table. I may not want to be doing some like energetic dancing with you. So like, please don't drag me into that. But if you want to like chill and just chat, I'm down. 
So those are those are some other things I've seen. And just far as just like yeah. really quick, easy, let's get everyone on the same page, give everybody some basic information we need to like take care of each other, show up well for each other, and kind of have a good distributed awareness of what's happening in the room, not just what's happening with like the people that you came here with. So yeah, yeah, no, um, I love that. I have actually I've been in a personal situation. I remember the I can remember the first time I was in that experience, and I was like this is amazing. Like there are things that are like, I know in this community that like might come up that like, I'm not currently in the place for. And it gave me the space to be like, Hey, like this isn't something that's going to work for me and to have those like boundaries, um, respected. And then in the reverse, um, I really love when you were providing the example of like, like I'm not energetically in the place to like be dancing all night but like mm -hmm. people know that they could come in and have an engaging conversation with you and you've just made it super clear like yeah if you want to connect with me like here's your pass like mm -hmm. how like that's that's great like especially like I think I think a lot of people have at least some element of social anxiety that can run around you know sometimes and like what a gift to be able to like dampen some of that because now I can be confident that I'm like I know what Dax wants and I know how mm -hmm. to show up with them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I think I'll just, I'll just tack one other thing on here, which is like, especially when you are talking about boundaries, one of the best way that, ways that you can frame boundaries to keep, to uh, maintain closeness and, and promote closeness with people is giving, uh, is giving a, not this, but that framing, yep. right? Like I'm not down for this, but I am down for that. If you want to engage, if you want to experience intimacy or closeness with me, this is on the table. Um, mm -hmm. It gives people it gives people something to start with, uh, mm -hmm. in a way that just a, a blanket no sometimes doesn't. So I think that can be helpful as well. Um, mm -hmm. I also really want to get into this final part of our talk where we talk about the intersection between consent and drugs and sex, which I think mm -hmm. is even less explored than the uh, the topic of uh, consent and drugs on its own. And there's a lot to unpack in here. Um, mm -hmm. Sloan, I wonder if you would kick us off and just give us a brief overview on some of the, the unique things that we might want to be thinking about in terms of this intersection between consent and drugs and sex and how it can differ from a situation where we are just talking about, say, uh, consent and sex. Yeah, I mean, um, there there's a, another layer of nuance added there, right? Like we're talking about informed consent with substances. We want to understand what we're taking, how we're taking it, why we're taking it, what to expect. We also, you know, want to be doing that in the sexual realm. And, and um, as far as what do you want, you know, what do you, like, how do you want to communicate consent? What's your go-to, you know, are there certain verbal things you say? Are there certain, you know, nonverbal cues that you prefer? Are there certain things you want to be called in the bedroom versus not? Um, those things separately, you know, are nuanced. And then when you bring them together, there's, you know, as there may be additional benefit, there, there can be additional risk. Knowing that when we're in an altered state of consciousness, that we might not always be able to be um, as informed as we might be in a sober state. We might not be as knowing or as aware of everything that's happening around us. We might be really, really aware of what's happening internally, but that can make it much harder to be in the present moment um, or vice versa. Um, and it can also make that, you know, um, the clear, explicit communication more difficult. I think, you know, anyone that has, you know, maybe done acid before, it can be hard to talk sometimes in a clear fashion. For other people, easy, easier than, you know, when they're sober, you know, it's, it's different for everyone. Um, so what we really want to be considering here, again, is, you know, do we have an idea in our, um, you know, um, most, knowing state, you know, what we would like to do um, and how. Um, I think there's also just like additional risk factors to consider, you know, can, like how does this substance impact my, you know, physicality? Uh, a lot of substances can either dampen or heighten physical sensation. Um, substances can also, you know, lead us to feel more in tune with our body and some substances make us feel completely detached from our body or our personhood. And when we're going to be interacting with our bodies, you know, we want to have awareness of how this is going to impact us. You know, um, some substances can enhance arousal 
am I feeling like really into this person because I, you know, just took some MDMA, you know, an hour or two ago, or is this like a genuine attraction? Is this something I really want in the moment? Um, you know, might I need a little additional lubricant because I've smoked weed all day and sex might be painful and potentially risky, you know, as far as physical harm, if I'm not doing that. Um, that's really a big thing I think to consider. And really like trauma can show up in any interaction. You know, we all have trauma. I think everyone collectively, I don't think I've met a human on earth. If you could find me one, that would be impressive, but everyone has it. Um, and this can really come up in sexual experiences and psychedelic experiences. And when you combine the two, when you are in this emotion, often really, you know, emotional vulnerable state, um, things can be intensified. And so I think a really key um, thing to be thinking about here is like, are you in a place where you can be a container for yourself, for another person? Do you have a plan in place also if, if things go awry for repair? That's especially important, I think, you know, on any substance. It's really important in just any sexual interaction. You know, when a consent violation occurs, having an idea of what you're going to do about it. How are we going to pause? How are we going to talk about this? Do you have an idea of what the person may need ahead of time? Um, you know, we want to have that idea, and especially so with substances um, involved. And aftercare, like aftercare is huge. I think we talk about like in, in the BDSM realm, it's huge, key, important, needed, um, you know, to do this aftercare, to really make sure whatever it may be. For some people, aftercare might just be like, that was fun. See ya, you know. Some people might need, you know, some cuddles, might need some, um, you know, to talk, to, to connect, to like look at each other. Um, so having an idea of what you need after the fact, um, especially when it comes to like physical needs, like do we need water? Do yeah. we need to take a breather and take a pause, whether during or after? Um, how, how was that experience for you? You know, how are you feeling after this? Are we feeling okay? What came up for you? You know, things can very well come up and we should be checking in for that throughout the process and processing after the fact to kind of integrate this experience um, to really make sure that we were understanding each other um, along the way and, and after the fact. Because also, you know, things in the moment, they might have been great. And then after the fact, you might realize, you know, I might actually, you know, what after interpreting this or after the interaction has gone on, I feel a little uncomfortable, like you said or did this you know, what did that mean? Or, you know, what, what was your intent behind that um, to get that clarifying information? And that can be really, that could be difficult in the moment. And that's something to like, think about as far as like, if we're still in a really altered state, it can be hard to maybe have these conversations. And that'll be a part of the aftercare talk. Like, what are we taking? What are we capable of doing in this moment? Do we have to have a check-in maybe five hours down the line with each other and see how things are going? Do we need space? Things like that um, to, uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many things to factor. I'm wondering if um, anything is coming to mind for you, Kristen. Hmm. Um, I think just really highlighting like the underlying place of assumption that we're working in, in this conversation right now, which is that sex ha happens on drugs. Um, mm -hmm. It's like the fact that society would like to pretend that it doesn't. Um, and, you know, this becomes really complicated when you, you know, take into consideration, like, um, <laughs> what is legal, what is ethical, um, how those two can be in conflict with one another. Um, and so for the sake of this conversation, this segment of our conversation, like we are operating under the premise that at times it is possible to provide consent on drugs or to have consensual sex on drugs, um, I think is the best way to say it. And um, highlighting that, like, you know, basically it started off as like, well, don't have sex on drugs, just revisit the connection later, which is kind of just like abstinence 2.0, because it's just like, mm -hmm. well, don't do it. Um, and uh, I think that it's important for us to think about, um, and like, I think what you were really highlighting Sloan is like, what, what, what does it look like for us to have the desire to pursue this, like what ultimate pleasure, right? The drugs are pleasurable, the sex is pleasurable, we're trying to combine the two, or perhaps like, maybe we're not even seeking the pleasurable experience of the drugs, but the drugs in and of themselves are helping the sexual experience be more pleasurable um, or tolerable, depending on like 
why you're seeking out to have consent in the first place and creating the space that there's a variety of reasons why um, someone might be having sex. Um, and, you know, thinking about, you know, then the next stage of that is, well, what if you just negotiate all of this up front? But wait, didn't we just say that consent was continuous, right? And so that's where like that check-in process and what Sloan was just highlighting is like super key, where um, I like that you, when you reference the, do we need to check in five hours down the line? I was like, oh, the scenario, the people in this scenario are obviously on acid. Um, and so- <laughs> They have um, three arms. Of course they have to check in five hours later. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it's just like, I think a really- potential key metric to consider of establishing consent in altered spaces is are you able to have the entire consent conversation that you would sober right now mm -hmm. are you able to like be present with yourself and like know what's going on for you and able to articulate that to someone else and as someone else like are you seeing that being demonstrated with the person that you're that you're with and like what are your social contracts with that person because even then like if we're going to make it even more nuanced like if i was having a sexual experience like with my partner and like maybe there was like something about words that weren't as like accessible or was like stumbling a little bit there still might be space for us to have something in our social contract to be like navigating that. But, and that's why it's like so important and so nuanced to take into consideration, like all the aspects of like what's going on. Like, how well do you know this person? How much do you trust this person? Do you have um, agreements about how you navigate repair? Um, because harm accidentally happens sometimes. Like you can have the best intentions showing up in all of your relationships and you can still accidentally hurt somebody. And how do you come back from that? Um, and so I think those are just some other points for consideration when thinking about uh, consent drugs and sex. Yeah, one, one thing you mentioned in there that uh, I'll just hop on again is that I think part of, uh, part of giving an ongoing, part of giving ongoing consent and having an ongoing conversation when substances are involved include communicating to other people how high you are and what you are capable of because you can't tell. You know, mm -hmm. like we were saying earlier, the, the same dose of the same substance for two different people can produce wildly different effects. And if you're not giving people that reflection, um, they may not have everything they need to know whether or not they feel comfortable trying to establish consent with you. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, and, and on the self-monitoring front, you know, like, uh, just like you said, Kristen, like, am, am I so high that I don't feel like I could give consent right now? Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I may have had an intention for how high I, I planned to be, but maybe I'm not, you know, like there's mm -hmm. a whole level of uncertainty that comes into play when substances, especially psychedelics, are involved. So like tracking mm -hmm. those things for yourself and other people is a really great way um, to provide care in this area. And I think that speaks to the need for a higher level of flexibility. Like when we're bringing mm -hmm. consent and drugs and sex into the picture, there's so many more variables to track. There's so much more nuance. Uh, mm -hmm. And so Sloan, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about flexibility in the context mm -hmm. of uh, in the context of consent and sex and drugs and how we think about that and how we navigate having a flexible attitude and mindset towards this. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in a lot of ways we've touched on this in bits and pieces here that when we have really had thoughtful, self-reflective um, and mutual conversations to plan, to really have a, a, a general constraint of like, Kind of like what the scene is going to be like maybe um we can think of it like as a play right like who are the actors what what are um what are the emotions that are going to be expressed what are the you know things that are specifically going to be happening in the scene down to even like the lighting right that gives you an idea about what's going to happen and where things go um generally speaking but like we really highlighted here uh, things go awry when sober and you know, experiences on psychedelics can be really, um, you know, unexpected at times. And I think if we can have that container, it allows us almost to give ourselves more permission to be flexible in the sense that when things come up, 
if we know we have general idea of where to go, what to do for repair, what is likely to occur for us, we can more flexibly attend to our needs. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a real key distinction too between like intent and expectation. Mm -hmm. We can have intent for an experience and that generally should be like, what feeling do you want to walk away with? Expectation is more like what events are going to occur. And that often changes. Um, I mean, both can change. But um, when we really hold tight to an expectation, like my, you know, this trip is going to be amazing. I'm going to process this trauma or, you know, I'm just going to have the most out of body, amazing sexual experience. And then something goes a little awry when we're really rigid. Um, we can experience a more difficult time when anytime we have rigidity, when it comes to emotional experience or psychological experience, we can get stuck in it. Um, you know, well, it kind of, it's kind of like digging a hole. Um, you're in a hole, you only have a shovel. If you keep digging, that's all you know how to do with that tool. And we're rigid with that tool. We're just going to keep digging the hole. Uh, it can make things very hard. Um, so if we allow ourselves some, um, to be a little more flexible, to have a little bit of acceptance that this may happen and I have a plan for it and I can take a step back, that can be, you know, really helpful, at least as far as like the difficult psychedelic experience. And when it comes to sex, you know, you might have to do things differently. Um, you know, having that end goal of orgasm often leads to disappointment because there's a lot of pressure there. You know, am I doing enough with this person? Um, you know, am I, um, how am I looking? You know, if I'm not feeling, you know, the amount of pleasure I'm expecting to feel, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with them? If our goal is to enjoy the experience, if we can have some flexibility about what sex looks like and sex on psychedelics especially looks like, we're more able to be in the present moment. We're more able to be aware of the pleasure as it occurs. You know, you just think about when you let go of the end game, the end goal, you can maybe enjoy more pleasure when you're noticing how the person is crossing your arm or how a light kiss feels. It allows you to get a little less out of your head and more into the experience. And that's especially needed in some of these, you know, psychedelic experiences where we can get so stuck in our head that we can even lose sight that there's another person in the room having this interaction with us. And the goal is for connection, right? We want to yeah. bring ourselves back to that connection. So, you know, flexibility lets you mitigate some of the risks. It lets you repair. And it also allows you to maximize pleasure. Like you can do a lot more when you're allowing yourself to be flexible in the experience. That's great. I really like that a lot. Um, I know we're coming up on time and I, I want to be respectful of uh, both of your time. Uh, but again, because I'm a psychedelic safety nerd, uh, I do want to ask Sloan, uh, one of the uh, one of the unique things about psychedelics is, uh, at least as a, a societal uh, tool, is the way that they are used often in ritual and ceremonial contexts. I know there's mm -hmm. been increasing dialogue about the role of consent in these kinds of spaces that could probably be an entire separate conversation in and of itself. Um, but I wonder if you'd be willing to just touch on that briefly for the folks who are listening who maybe have some familiarity with those environments or maybe thinking about getting into one of those kinds of environments and wanna know how to, uh, how to navigate it well. Yeah, I mean, this could be like a talk for hours now. Um, but I, I think when, um, you're layering, you know, what we've already talked about as far as, you know, altered consciousness and how that impacts like informed consent, you know, enthusiastic, really given consent. Um, when you're adding in a ceremonial uh, or spiritual, ritualistic, any of these um, sort of experiences into the mix, um, there is uh, the potential for coercion really I mean especially when there is an authority figure involved like a spiritual community leader even a you know psychedelic um, assisted psychotherapist mm -hmm. you know there's a power dynamic at play um, you're engaging with an authority figure and that can really I mean it does create a power imbalance where you may feel in these interactions that um the other person is the, you know, container of all this knowledge that you don't have, that they have the key to you having a spiritual experience that will be enlightening for you. Uh, and you can lose sight of the fact that you're interacting with another human being 
who has their own fallacies, their own biases, their own you know, social and cultural constructs that they're not free from just because they may be an enlightened individual or a spiritual individual, you know, that they're, they're um, just as, um, you know, subject to some of the mistakes that we all make. Um, and, and there's potential for, you know, real abuse of power there where um, someone can coerce you into sex when you may not want it because they may say it's part of the ritual or you are in an altered headspace where you're not fully conscious of what's happening in the physical realm, um, where you could have, you know, someone take advantage of you in that way. I think there's also like the spiritual component of it, like you're spiritually vulnerable in these experiences. Mm -hmm. And there's consent involved in that area um, in the sense that um, you're opening yourself up to another person and it can be extremely violating to have someone not respect those boundaries um and you're more likely potentially you know to um you know get lost in the moment perhaps or um be swayed one way or another in that vulnerable state especially with someone that you hold in high regard um so you know i when i think about um safety in these interactions i think there's like so many you know different components of it but really having an idea of you know what you're getting yourself into not just like what the substance can bring out in you but who are you going to see you know are they are they reputable are they you know what is their social and cultural context are you seeing you know a you know white person out west who has started their own clinic or are you going for an ayahuasca trip what are the you know cultural expectations for how um you know people of a variety of genders interact with each other um, you know, how, you know, even how you dress, how you speak, you know, can play a part in this interaction. I think the most key thing to recognize is that sex is not a part of these ceremonies before, during, or after, and, and you know, a legitimate practice because of this power imbalance and, you know, the, the ability to take advantage of someone. Um, so, so really owning that. Um, and you may want you know, some people seek out these sexual experiences with these healers, but recognizing that sex doesn't necessarily give you access to power or enlightenment or, you know, a certain um, spiritual experience, um, knowing that um, there's going to be that power imbalance at play, um, you know, that's something that you might want to consider. And it's just not ethical, really, um, in these situations to be engaging sexually. Um, I, I've seen people recommend having someone with you, just like you might have like a sitter in a, a psychedelic experience, really knowing who you're going to be with. And if you're going to be seeing a shaman or a healer, having another trusted person with you to, to watch and monitor, I think is a really, really great idea because you are going to be in a very vulnerable, you know, state physically and, you know, potentially emotionally and psychologically. Um, so having someone there watching, monitoring, um, and, you know, really making clear what type of touch you're okay with, because some touch is involved in some of these ceremonies um, and really knowing that any touch of private parts is not a part of the experience. It's, it's not, um, you know, ethical and really making clear with the person ahead of time what you're okay with, especially when trauma may come up in these experiences, um, having them be aware, you know, what might come up for you um, and how, um, that can be medicated to keep you safer in these interactions where that's not being taken advantage of. Absolutely. That's great. Thanks for all I'd that. I'd like to add real quick too, um, just because I have recently had a couple conversations with people seeking out um, these spiritual experiences um, in a specifically in Western um, culture and uh, I really want to encourage people to remember that uh, you have your own power and how to use that and like don't be afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to like I encourage people to assess like who are you going to be spending your time with and if someone is having a poor reaction to you simply trying to seek additional information out of a place of concern for your own health and safety, 
that's a red flag. And I would highly reconsider who you're doing your work with. Mm -hmm. um, because if they're having an ego response to you questioning uh, them, that makes me really question whether they're in the position to be able to hold a container that's appropriate for mm -hmm. healing. Uh, I think that there needs to be a certain level of humbleness that mm -hmm. is coming in the, holding those types of containers mm -hmm. for other people. If there's signs that there's lack of like empathy, concern for someone else, um, those are all things that are considered mm -hmm. red flags. And on the flip side, um, the positive side of all the things I mentioned, like those are your green flags and like start assessing. Um, and I would also say like, trust yourself and like develop your self-trust and um, do what you uh, can to, you know, take yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. You, you've made me think of like one last few points. I'm like, ah, oh, I want to bring up, especially in this community, um, in that there's often like this mentee mentor sort of role where you may feel like a pressure of expectation that I, I should be doing this in order to receive the knowledge. And that paired with toxic positivity and spiritual gaslighting which often occurs, or I've seen often, unfortunately, you know, in these spaces that, you know, there, there's this like purity culture around spiritualism and, 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 and like this idea of enlightenment even, where, um, you know, from unfortunately these, some of these leaders that are put on pedestals, like there's this idea that um, they're spiritually pure um, and that um, to go against them, to reject them, to have questions is to reject them and to reject the practice in some way. Um, and, you know, we, we can really gaslight people, you know, deny their experience when we are telling them, you know, you know, just be positive or, you know, that wasn't the intent behind this or they're just trying to help you X, Y, Z. Um, and we really need to be mindful of that, that it's victim blaming in many ways and that um, we're not acknowledging the fact that difficult experiences happen um, and that we, we need to be talking about them and honoring them just as much as we honor positivity because we can take it far too far and totally deny a person's reality. And that's extremely traumatic and harmful. Yeah, yeah, I, all, all of this is super, super key. Uh, one, one other thing I would tack on to uh, something you said, Kristen, around uh, the asking of questions and what, noticing somebody's reactions if you ask additional questions is um, if you are going to enter an interaction with someone where you are um, uh, where you are curious about how how their own consent practices and attitudes are, uh, it is also totally valid to do a small experiment by setting a small, uh, maybe like not that consequential, but nonetheless important boundary and see how someone reacts. Right. If someone if someone can gracefully roll with your boundary, even if it's something relatively small, um, that gives you information. If they don't, that also gives you a lot of information um, that uh, has a lot of applicability and can move you just as asking questions can from sort of the abstract. I have a good vibe on this person to I have actually like put them under the gun. I have run them through their paces in a gentle, nice way, mm -hmm. and they passed with flying colors. It's a it's a different level of certainty that you can mm -hmm. establish and that you have you do have that level of agency and it's okay to do that. Yeah. And to right. have questions doesn't mean you're not open to experience. Yeah. It means you're wanting, it means you're curious and you want to have the best experience possible, but we need some safety around this openness. Um, I, I think that, you know, that's really important for us to hold in mind that that's good, that that is what we want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we're just at about time here. Uh, I want to wrap up. Do either of you have any closing remarks or things you'd like to bring in before we wrap? Um, I would like to share a quote that has come up for me a couple of times during our talk. Um, just because I have continued to see a narrative sometimes about, you know, fear, not consent, um, and navigating uh, consent can like ruin the vibe of the experience that somehow talking about things ahead of time 
uh, like kills the opportunity for spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And a quote that I have always really enjoyed, and I think this is applicable for all the topics that we, you know, all, you know, all the topics that we covered, consent, consent and drugs, consent, sex and drugs, um, that anything, uh, how does it go? It's anything that is lost in negotiation is made up for in anticipation. And it's the idea that by talking ahead of time about what you are and are not going to engage in, you're able to actually build excitement and enthusiasm for what is to come. You're building up desire. Um, and so that is just something that I would leave people to think about um, and to share with others, um, to start debunking this myth that somehow consent is ruining a good time when it's actually the basis and right. foundation of having a good time. Right, right. You, uh, some, one of you used the term roadmap earlier, right? Here is a roadmap for how to give, for, for how to show up for me in a great way, right? If you want to show me a great time, if you want me to say tomorrow, such and such person, I had a great time with them, here's exactly how to do it. Just mm -hmm. follow, follow the map. I think that's mm -hmm. such a great gift that you can give someone, especially new people who you're not, maybe not comfortable with and haven't uh, had a lot of time to get to know yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Just having a couple of those touchstones still leaves so much room for spontaneity in the navigation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, so are there any final, final thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap? Um, you know, I adore that quote. And that would be the quote I would want to end on. Um, but yeah, I, I just think like leaving it at like consent as a practice of love and, and care for the self and for others. And it's, you know, how we have interactions of understanding and connection. And it, it doesn't just reduce risk, it maximizes pleasure. And that's, that's the whole point. Um, I, I think of it like Camping, you got all your gear, you're going to have a lot more fun of a time than if you are in a tent and you have a leak in your, you know, roof and you're getting soaking wet and you have none of your supplies. It just allows you to be more flexible and explore more. And that's the goal. We're exploring each other. Right. Amazing. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time. This has been great. I've learned a lot. I hope the folks watching have learned a lot. And uh, if you are watching, please run with it. Please share this. Please get this out into the world. This is important information. It helps us all do well by each other. And now that you have this information, you can be an ambassador in your personal life and in your community uh, to really bring awareness of some of these things out into the world and make the world a better place. So thank you all so much for coming to hang out with us today. This has been our chat on consent and substances. Hi.